Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for turning up. Good morning, Kurt. Uh, appreciate it's Friday morning. It's not necessarily the easiest one to attend, so thank you for coming. Um, you know by now all the house rules, right? Make sure your phones don't go off. No, 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 no. Okay. Um, File exit over there. Um, fine. Okay. So um, I'm Paul Weir. Uh, I'm a composer, sound designer. Uh, basically, do any audio production. If you're going to give me some cash, I'm quite happy to do uh, anything. Um, I've been around for quite a long time now. Um, I'm the audio director of uh, Hello Games, um, as well as being an audio director for Microsoft. Um, so essentially, I'm freelance with, with two jobs, which is quite nice to be in that position. Um, but today, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the process of uh, sound designing No Man's Sky uh, and uh, the music creation process we went through as well. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the tools that we created and hopefully show them to you. Some stuff will almost certainly crash, I'm going to warn you now. There's going to be a little bit of having to rig up things, so just bear with me. I'll get that in early. Um, uh, just uh, again, a quick show of hands, I hate doing this, but um, are you familiar with the game No Man's Sky? Uh, any, uh, stick it up. So not everyone, that's fine, most people. Okay, fine, fine. Um, so No Man's Sky uh, is a procedurally driven uh, science fiction like an action adventure game. Um, it's quite, it crosses several different genres. You can treat it as pure exploration, you can treat it as an ambient experience if you want, um, or you can treat it more as a kind of uh, uh, proactive trade, kind of uh, almost a little bit like Elite in some ways. Um, there's, there's no real story structure to it. Um, it's very uh, open ended, and we have some light narrative on, on top. So there's no real voiceover. We've got a little bit of voice, but um, it's mostly about the experience. Um, Hello Games, if you don't already know, is, is a small company. We're still a small company. So throughout development, there's probably between about 12 main part of development when I was involved, about 12 to 15 people for the entire development team, which is obviously still quite small. Um, so the audio department is obviously me, and that was it. Um, but I had a lot of help from other people. So I just want to, first of all, just give some thanks to some people who were involved, because it's important. Sometimes, like, I'm seen as the audio person for No Man's Sky. Um, but we had Harry Denham, who is a programmer at Hello Games, who isn't an audio programmer, but, but bless them, helped me with all my audio issues, with the wise integration and things like that. Super fantastic, super useful to have a coder who's on the side of audio. You know, even if they're not the audio coder, someone looking out after you, it's really lovely. Um, and I've got a DSP programmer called Sandy White. So if you're British and old, like I am, uh, Sandy wrote Antitac back in the 80s on the ZX Spectrum. Uh, super bright guy. If you've ever been to any of my talks before, I've talked about him in the past because he often does kind of my tricky DSP problems. Um, and right at the end of the development, I also had uh, a freelance audio co coder called Andy Hutchings uh, to help profile wise and get our performance up to scratch. So it's just important because I don't want it to make it look like I did everything. Um, I, I did all the creative content and technical design, but you know, obviously I had help with my friends. Uh, so I'm going to show you a short video now, um, which is just a series of clips uh, of uh, different examples of sound design from the game, um, just to kind of show the range that, that you find uh, in the game.
So the obvious challenge with a game like this is both its, its scope and the simple fact that I don't know what a planet is before it's created. Um, and if you've been to any of the talks from Hello uh, Games guys, it's the same problem. How do you generate a landscape with all the features of a landscape without knowing in advance what the elements of those landscape, uh, what the landscape is? Um, so we had to develop certain tools in order to, to understand the environment around us. Now, in a normal game, uh, if I take an example of uh, things like, like maybe a building. Uh, in a normal game, you've got a building geometry. You know where the building is going to be in advance. Uh, you can pre-bake things like obstruction occlusion, um, uh, or you can add extra geometry to cope with that. But we don't have any of that. So, so I, I don't know anything until the engine reports back to me. So we had to uh, build in WISE a lot of systems which are very heavily state-driven uh, and switch-driven in order to make decisions in real time. So that's some of which I'm going to show you some of those uh, little tools there. This, this next slide is going to be nothing new to many of you. Um, but I think for our game in particular, it was really important that we moved away from simple one-on-one -on -one, uh, event-driven uh, audio. So something happens in the game, it triggers a sound. Now, obviously we still do that, right? There's UI sounds that where, where we do that. Um, and there's certain set animations that don't change, so we'll do that for that. But wherever possible, I'm trying to boil down um, right, all the audio behaviors and all the actual audio content into as few actual trigger events as possible. Um, so a good, a good example of that, which I'll show you next, is how we handle ambient sounds. So that, going to system-driven, if you can do it, because you do need data coming back from the game, it has to be a two-way relationship, uh, makes it very flexible, makes it very extensible. So, for example, um, biomes. Every, pla every planet type has its own kind of atmosphere, its own characteristic. So you might have a, like a jungle planet or a frozen planet. So if we introduced a, t a whole new planet type, I don't need a programmer to do anything for me. Literally, a programmer just tells me what the name of that planet type is. I go off and do all my audio, and in WISE, just allocate that um, as a new state, uh, and it pops in. Uh, same for ship engines. If we have a new ship engine, don't need any coding support, just add it straight in as, as a new uh, state. Uh, some bits can be switched, or whatever. Uh, and it's there. So it gives me, as a sound designer, a lot of flexibility and a lot of control. Right. I'm not trying to sell WISE. Uh, WISE was a good solution for us. There are other solutions available. Um, so I was going to show you... Uh, so I'll get to the example in a second. So as a sound designer, though, there are certain like, key things I wanted to achieve right from the beginning. And I always had in mind the sensation of like, being in a spaceship but parked on a planet and having the rain uh, on the cockpit window. Like, which is very emotive. And for a science fiction game, uh, what I've tried to as much as possible is to have very relatable sounds. Like, sure, the sci-fi sounds, absolutely, the ships are sci-fi, but wherever possible on the planets, make it familiar. Uh, like wind, water, birds, are all uh, very emotive sounds, all stochastic sounds, and um, through evolution, you know, we've learned to associate them with, with peace and with calmness. Uh, and there's a certain kind of feeling we get with them. I think some of the nicest feedback I had was um, on Twitter with someone saying that when he was in the ship and it was raining, it kind of reminded him of being on like, his dad's farm uh, in America, you know, it's, uh, in the pickup truck and just sitting there waiting for the storm to pass. And that's, that's lovely. That's, that's an emotive moment. And I'm, I'm trying to manufacture those kind of little emotive moments, um, but I can't plan for that. I can only build the systems that will allow for that. I don't, I don't have a key event where that's gonna, I know that's going to happen. Um, uh, so I was going to show you these, uh, how we handle events. So this is a good example. Um, I, I can attempt to show it to you in WISE. Will I do that? We'll see how ambitious I am. Um, so we have one WISE event with this name that handles all our global ambiences, all our local ambiences, uh, the weather effects, uh, whether there are creatures or not. Um, so it's a combination of, for biomes, it's going to be uh, state. So you can only ever exist in one planet at a time. So that's a global uh, uh, ambience. Uh, for localized ambiences, it's a switch. So for example, you could be in a forest. And we have to work out, uh, through ray casting, which I'll show you, what a forest is, because there's nothing in the game to say, I'm a forest. Uh, same for water. Like, again, in a normal game, 
you would have some kind of emitters placed on the water. And water is generated, or you know where the water is, so you place some geometry, and you go, here are my sound emitters, and it's on top of water. I can't do that. Like, I don't know where there's going to be water. So again, we're, we're having to calculate stuff all in real time. And then the rain, uh, it's ended up being a bit of a joke. I, I keep telling, telling Sean Murray, but we've basically built a rain simulator uh, because I can't get enough rain into the game. I just love rain sounds. Um, so we started off with just the rain is on or off. But as we've updated the game, we have things like, are you near a building? In which case, play some rain on building. Are you near some trees? So play that. So it's all additive. They're all multiple layers. Um, I'll show you a video in a second of what happens when it's raining and you go into a building. Uh, I'll talk over a little bit, but it'll explain how we're using systems, states, and then real-time controllers to kind of mix different elements in and out. And it's fine if, if, as a player, you don't notice this. And that's kind of, I think as a game, it's one of the curious things about this particular game. Many of the games I've worked on, you want those big moments, right? Especially as a sound designer, like, you know, we've got fairly big egos. So you kind of want to get into a key event and you want to fire off and you want to make it sound really awesome and go, wow. We don't really have those moments. We've just got long stretches of gameplay uh, where it's up to a player what they do. I quite like that. So what I've tried to do is add all these little subtle layers that maybe you pick up and maybe you won't. But it kind of combines into a bigger thing where it's, it makes it more of a believable uh, environment. Not, not realistic, I'm not interested in realism. Um, but I want to give you a sense of presence uh, in that, in that uh, planet or that space. So let me show you this uh, video about uh, rain. I said I love rain. Um, so what you'll see is raining outside, I go inside. Um, I'll talk over it a little bit, as I say, to explain what's happening. So as we go inside, the indoor rain will play. And that's room dependent, but we're now also detecting whether you're close to a window. Just back here, that little kind of rain against the window. And then as I go up here, because it's room dependent, then that we're going to have rain on glass, because that's a glass surface. And these are all different rain uh, loops. Right. So spectacularly unexciting. You know, you don't have to catch rain. You don't. Thank you. You don't have to <laughs> wait till the end. All right. Um, uh, and really, it's not. You know, it's, it's not showy. It's just what it is. Um, but again, I don't know that there's a window there. Like we don't know. So we have to keep detecting, am I near glass? You know, is the glass a window? In which case, then start to ramp up that particular sound. Um, we also do this little thing, which, which I quite liked we did it early on, is when you change states, so when you come from indoors to outdoors, we boost all the ambiences by 6 dB, just for a few seconds, just to give you that kind of sense of rush. Same as when you come out, come out of the ship. Um, so it, and it's a difficult game to mix, as you can imagine, with all these different elements. So one, how we do that, uh, ray casting is really important for us. So again, like ray casting is commonly done for various different audio purposes. We're using it to detect the environment. So we have beams that go up to detect um, enclosure or enclosedness. That's not a word, but you understand what I'm saying, which is how covered am I? And again, we don't know that. So uh, that's an analog value. So if you're partially covered, I will start to change some of the sound design. Uh, we'll have some kind of like little rumbles coming in. Uh, we'll start to have a low pass filter on some of the sounds. But after a period of time, if a, if a ray casting system goes, I'm 100% enclosed, therefore the logic is I must be in a cave. So if we're in a cave, we'll change state. And that will obviously affect the ambiences, it will affect the veins, it will affect all the mix and filtering of external sounds. Uh, same for water. So we have to detect, am I close to water? Is there anything obstructing me from the water? Um, and then we've got, uh, we've got beams that go straight down uh, to detect uh, footsteps as well, whether you're in contact with the ground. 
because that's a bloody hard problem. Right? If, you, if you worked on games before, even normal games, it's actually sometimes quite hard to detect am I in contact with the ground. When you've got a surface which is continually changing over time, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real issue. And then we've got another beam which heads towards the sun, and I have absolutely no idea why we've got that. Program to put it in for some reason. Uh, and similar for the water. So we use uh, a, a dynamic emitter system for the water. Again, wise handles for this kind of thing. So uh, we don't want loads of sound emitters stretched across the water. And uh, if you watch it, in, it live, it's quite, it's quite cute because these little emitters kind of dance around and kind of follow you around. So they're always tracking your position so that you hear the fact that there's water. Um, but if you go into like uh, free cam and go near the water, you won't hear the water because it doesn't know that the camera is near the water. So we're always kind of just building stuff around you to give you perception of things are happening when it's, you know, in a sense, it's all a lie. But also we get lots of stuff for free. So you come into the water. If you walk out of the water, you're going to have wet footsteps, right? Because we've, we have that data in the system. So because we've gone so state-based and we're getting all this data back, we can get loads of stuff for free. I, I don't need any, any more support for that. Uh, a good example, really simple example, is storms. Again, nice weather effects. Um, behind the scenes, technically, the storm sounds are playing all the time, but they're on the slider to go, is it really stormy? If it's not, pull it to zero. So all this audio is uh, just as virtual voices. But we know if you're indoors, you're outdoors. So recently, I was like, OK, well, I know you're indoors. Let's just have indoor storm sounds. Like, Okay. Don't need anyone to do that for me. I just need to put the audio in. We are lucky in that um, we stream a little bit of textures occasionally, but, but pretty well all the streaming is for audio. Like 90% of the stream is for audio. So I don't have any uh, limitations on how big my file sizes need to be, which is splendid. Um, so you know we don't need to have a 30 second rain loop. I can just have a three minute rain loop. And up until now, no one complains. At some point, some code is going to tell me off for doing that. Um, so again, Sean Murray often says, like, the game, the actual game install is from, like, 500 meg for the game and all the assets. And originally, it was one and a half gig for audio, which is compressed. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of grown and grown and grown. So it's really nice to say, we've got a game where two thirds, three quarters of it is just audio, um, which is a win for audio people. I'm very happy about that. OK, so if we move on to the idea of procedural generation uh, and as it relates to audio, like, you're probably familiar with the discussions that have been going on with people talking about procedural audio. Um, I'm going to try and show you some examples of how we, how we do that. But just first of all, just talk very, very briefly on what is uh, procedural generation content. Uh, just in case you're not familiar, I won't spend much time on it. Uh, so. It, you, know, you can define it as any kind of algorithmically created content, so any computer-generated content uh, based on some logic system. So very common to use it uh, for things like textures, uh, for things like landscape generation. And it's super useful where there's an issue of scale. So handcrafting landscapes is hard and time-consuming, so if you can get the computer to do it, that's so much the better. And it's not either or. So usually you would have some procedural content uh, but then fully authored content alongside it. The, some of the difficulties of procedural content, um, and it's quite common to do level design with, uh, procedurally as well, is to give a sense of this kind of meaningfulness, like, like, like it feels like it's handcrafted. Like, an audio equivalent would be, and we'll come back to this, uh, one of my big issues is that if you have procedural audio, the perception of it has to be as good as traditional audio. Right? It's no good if you compromise and go, well, it's procedural, and it sounds a bit shit, but it doesn't matter because it's procedural. That's, that's not acceptable. As a sound designer, I can't accept that. Um, and it's easier visually you can get away with it. It's harder in terms of audio. So there is this problem of does it feel guided, does it feel crafted when it's not. And also this really interesting issue that we kept coming up against in the game, which is you can generate variety, you can generate infinite variety, but as humans, we don't perceive that. We perceive this kind of uh, sense it never really changes, ironically, because it's always changing. So to illustrate that would be, say, sky colours. If you have all the colours of a rainbow possible for the sky, 
very quickly you go, oh, it's just a, it's a pink sky planet, right? It looks all the same to the others. It's not the same, but it feels the same because you're seeing all the graduations. So even though that's possible, in fact, what you end up doing is kind of chunking it up. It's almost like quantizing it. And you're like, okay, I'm not going to give you all the shades. I'm going to give you specific shades. We could generate all, but we're not. Um, and that was also relevant for some of the audio technology that I'll show you. you know, yes, it's possible to do wide range, but you don't pick it up. What you want is kind of, ah, I haven't heard that before. That's different. I notice that's different. So uh, a good example of that, then, uh, I talked about uh, procedural generation, uh, the landscape generation. Uh, so the textures are of photo textures, but the landscape is mathematically corrected, it, it, calculated, that's Terragen. And then we get into the tricky problem talking about audio, what is procedural audio, right? And I'm not saying that I've got the definition. I've got a definition. I'm not saying it's the definition, uh, but as I've done it, I'm going to say it's the definition, because I'm allowed to do that here. But there's this real ambiguity, like what actually is procedural audio? What does that mean? I have no end of students uh, kind of giving me their, their uh, master's thesis uh, and essays and wanting to interview about procedural audio, which is fantastic. But no one seems clear, like what the hell is it? So it could be, for example, physical modeling of sounds. So that, that could be a good, good explanation. So it's mathem mathematically creating sounds, and that would seem to fit quite well. So a really uh, simple example of that would be this violin sound, or cello. And that's just a reactor uh, with a physical modelled stringed instrument. We'd be trying to play it on, on my keyboard and kind of failing. Um, but yeah, there's no samples, there's no recording, it's all mathematically calculated. And string instruments and wind instruments uh, work relatively well like that. Uh, procedural audio could involve granular synthesis. I was talked yesterday uh, on that subject. Um, or I've often seen it as really any form of synthesis could be procedural audio. Or even I've seen people talk about uh, just using DSP effects. So the problem I have with that is it can't just be DSP effects, right? Because we've used reverbs and filters and distortions you know, literally for decades, right? So if you're going to say that's procedural audio, then just basically everything's procedural audio and it's pointless. Um, I object to real-time synthesis because from the 80s, late 70s, early 80s, that's what games were doing. Yeah, arcade games had a little, often a Yamaha chip, and we're creating the sound live using synthesis. So, yeah, okay, maybe that's procedural audio, but it, kind of, it needs to be more than that, right? Um, and granular synthesis, again, it's not a new idea. It's been around in games for at least a decade, often used for, uh, for car racing games. Uh, if you play Quantum Break, then their time dilation audio effect is a, a granular synthesis effect. It's, it's very nice. Um, and if we use physical modeling, is that in itself just enough? All right. Is it, does it mean just I'm modeling a sound and that's it, that is procedural? So my question is, if it is just that and everyone's talking about it, where is it? Like, where are the games that are doing it? Okay. And I think there's certain issues. I'll, I'll get to the definition of what I think it is. But if you're gonna make some new audio technology it's hard. It's hard to justify the cost. Now, I think it's a very good thing to do, and I think you should do it, but it's a difficult argument, right? Because everyone's comfortable with their tools, or we have a job to do, we've got lots of sounds to make in a very short amount of time with very little money, right? So we need to get on with it. And to, be able, and to have to say, excuse me, I can't do anything for the next six months because I need a programmer to build this for me, is a very hard uh, argument to make. But it's also very much a multidisciplinary problem. So you need sound designers or audio directors who are either programmers themselves, and I'm not a programmer, or very technically literate, and are able to define a problem for a programmer to solve in a way that is coherent and a programmer can understand. And many audio directors I know are very good, not everyone is very good at that. You know, some people struggle to communicate in an effective way with coders. There aren't any commercial tools yet. There are 
uh, some very, very nearly uh, out of the market, but there's still a lack of off-the-shelf tools to build things. Yes, you could use Pure Data uh, or Max MSP, uh, Flowstone is another one, um, but they, they're difficult to implement in games. They're not really game ready. And uh, of the existing procedural audio that I've heard, uh, they tend to pick off a really obvious simple examples. I'm not criticizing for that, but it does tend to be things like wind and rain and sounds like that. Now, as a sound designer, I object to that on a moral basis because it's almost like um, uh, it's treating sounds as a function rather than uh, a creative emotive element. So I've already talked about rain, but wind, there's a thousand different types of wind. It could be the gentle wind in the trees, which is reassuring. It, it could be the, the winter wind through a crack in the door. It could be the spooky wind that you get in a horror film, right? It has a character, has a life to it. And that's what we do. We go off and we record these sounds and we go, all right, that's going to make me feel a certain thing. And so to have wind that is essentially filtered white noise, and I'm doing them a disservice, but you get the point. It's saying, okay, there's wind, right, we've solved that, let's move on. Um, there's a bit of noise and we add a filter to it and that can be our, our lane uh, and we'll move on. And there's a place for that, but it's not where I want to go. So what I'm saying is that uh, procedural audio, to make it different, to make it procedural, it has to be driven by the game, right? So there's something where it's not just, here's a sound, play a sound. It's, what are you doing, game? I'm going to react to that in some way, and that's going to be reflected in the sounds that I'm producing. In order to do that, it has to use some form of real-time generated sound. So maybe it could be recording with multiple layers of DSP, uh, or maybe it could be real-time synthesis. And what you're trying to do is avoid a sense of repetition. Again, I'm not looking for realism, but I am looking for something to be believable. Right? And one of the huge benefits, if you're generating all of this in real-time, is you can avoid repetition. Uh, and finally, I, I really like the idea of uh, making use of emergent properties so that you end up with all these inputs uh, coming into your sound generation and it starts to do things you don't necessarily expect it to do. Right? It becomes a bit chaotic. And that's hard sometimes because we want absolute control over how things sound. Um, but it's also really freeing to go, actually, I don't always know what it's going to do. And like for our game, we agreed that sometimes it may sound really awful. Right? It may do something that sounds a bit broken, but that, that was an acceptable trade-off in order to give us the range and flexibility. So I'm going to attempt to sum that up in a, in a definition. Um, so I would say that procedural audio is a creation of sound in real time using synthesis techniques such as physical modeling uh, with deep links into game systems. Welcome to discuss that later. Uh, or we'll take some questions on that. But that's my attempt to at least define what I think procedural audio is. So let's move on to an example of that and what we tried to do for the game. So we built uh, a system in order to synthesize the vocals of the creatures. Right. And that was a very, very early decision because I knew that was going to be a problem. Like, doing creature sounds is tricky in normal times, but to do it for such a massive variety of, of different types of creatures, different sizes, different appearances. Yeah, I knew that was going to be hard. Sure, we could use recordings, but we'd have to use a huge library of recordings. Um, so literally from the beginning when I was involved, I was like, let's attempt to synthesize it because synthesizing a vocal tract is a known problem. Right? It's done in medical science. You know, it's, we, we wouldn't be the first ones to do it. So that in itself is reassuring. I'm not trying to cover new ground. I'm trying to take what's already there. And we ended up building it as a, as a WISE plugin, uh, which has its pros and cons. Um, WISE is getting better, but it's still a little bit limited uh, in, uh, in its synthesis capabilities and building a synthesizer plugin. It's much better with uh, just processors, audio effects. Um, anyway, we're not working. But we also quickly realized and this is a key part to procedural audio, that it's not just synthesis, that there has to be a performance aspect to it. Right? Something has to drive the synthesizer. Right? And if it's an engine sound, it could simply be, how fast am I going? But if it's something like creature vocals, where's that performance going to come from? Right? 
So you can try and mechanize it, which is one of the things we did, and I'll talk about it. Um, or you, you approach it from a different angle. So in the game, if you've played it, uh, all the creature sounds uh, are, are created uh, using Vocalion, uh, including all the bird sounds and the ambience in the background, um, which, are, which I've never mentioned, uh, and I've, I, they're rather nice. And that does give us the flexibility to go, it's night time, change what the birds are doing. Like, literally change your vocal tracks. Birds don't have vocal tracks, but change the sound that birds are making, uh, depending on the time of day. Uh, make them tweet less, make them sound like different creatures. Right? It gives us all that flexibility. So Vocalion sits within WISE, and I'll show you the structure of how that works. Uh, it has to be low latency, has to be really low CPU, because it has to run on PS4, and we have to have multiple instances. Um, and it's a game. It's a console game. It has to be super reliable. And that, as we know, developing code, particularly chaotic DSP code, that is also 100% reliable, as close as we can get it, is a difficult challenge. So it involves lots of testing. And when we're building it, one option is to go with digital waveguides, which is a known technique where you pre-compute uh, resonant frequencies, like in a pipe, it's typically used for that. That's problematic because the patents are a little bit ambiguous. Um, I think Yamaha owned the patents. Now, it's not clear if they're still applicable or not. So we decided not to go that route. Uh, so what, in the end, Vocalion is, is essentially a pipe, and the pipe has a reed at one end. Right. There's no traditional sound genera generator in it. So there's no sine waves, there's no noise generators. It in itself is not you know, generating for sound. It's much like my, uh, feedback from a microphone. Right? You wouldn't say, where's the sound generator in the feedback? Right? So it's a bit like swinging a pipe around your head right? and, it, and, and it whistles at you. So essentially what we've got is a feedback loop with resonant points within the pipe. But because we've got the reed at one end, then the air is traveling uh, backwards and forwards through the pipe as, you, as the reed pushes it back in and out. So there's a whole feedback, literally a feedback loop in it. And if you stimulate it enough, you'll start to get these, literally these points of noise, which ways, where you start to use really sharp filters, you can shape into what sounds like, sounds like essentially sounds, uh, added with a kind of mouth element at the end, which is your phoneme filtering. So if you're familiar with phonemes, it'll be I, wah, wah, right? Just moving of your mouth, it's just a filter, right? Uh, and phoneme filtering is very well understood. So we could apply all the typical phonemes, in fact, invented a couple of new phonemes because we're alien creatures. But it's also super important to have the sense of movement, okay? So not to create a pipe that's just static, that sounds really artificial. And so our system has to be, also has to be chaotic, right? So we've built into it, the fact that things are always going to be jiggling around, like values are going to be jiggling around. And that is the hardest point of, of anything we've developed. It's not creating the code, it's not the implementation, it's the fine tuning of those algorithms. Right. And you literally have to sit there, Sandy sat there, literally fiddling with numbers to get those points where it sounded acceptable and it had a wide enough range, but it didn't suddenly explode and just create bursts of noise at you or howls of sine waves and things like that, which it did during development. I am going to attempt to show you this live. It should work. It, it's a high probability something's going to crash, okay? So I'll show you an image first, but you have to give me 30 seconds while I fire everything up, because if I keep it fired up, it will crash. And you'll get the idea. Okay. So Voc Alien sits and wires. That's where all the DSP stuff happens. But how do we control it? And it's really tricky to control it. Effectively, we've created a wind instrument. Um, so we used an off-the-shelf uh, MIDI control system and built our own uh, MIDI control surface that sits on the iPad. So it is a synthesizer, and this is the MIDI control surface, which I will, I say, I will attempt to get up. Um, and there's actually multiple tabs that you can see at the top, but that's the main page. And just to very quickly run through it, this enables me to, for example, change the length of a pipe. We're actually not one pipe, we're four different pipes stuck together right, to create added complexity. Uh, it allows me to add some filters. Um, we've got these abstract terms of harshness and screech, and that's kind of like the roughness of it. It's like the energy going into it, how rough that energy is. So if you keep all those low, you'll get a very kind of pure sound. Um, 
We have, so I said we haven't got traditional synthesizers, we have just got some noise generators. But they're effectively used as frequency modulators. So again, it gives it kind of a shakiness, this roughness you wouldn't otherwise get. And then uh, traditional volume envelopes, attack, so how long the sound comes in, release. And then the really fun stuff um, is all those presets, uh, the formant filtering, which is your phonemes, and the energy, uh, so bottom right there. So that, we usually play this without attached to a gyroscope, which is why I we went for the iPad. So you can, as you'll see, you move the iPad, you can change what the sound is. I would say one of the really clever things that Sandy did was uh, preset morphing. So again, if you've used React, it's the same uh, kind of principle. Each of those 26 slots can be a different creature sound, but we will interpolate between each of those sounds. So we could use it, and we do use it, to say a creature is happy, it's just burbling away, it's giving little wails, through to the other extreme where it's, you're shooting it and it's dying and it's screaming at you. Right? So they're different setups, but we can uh, slide that, that morph slider and you'll hear that as a performance. And we capture all that as well. So I'll show you how we capture it. And then at the wise side, you won't be able to read this. Maybe, oh, actually, maybe you can. This is what we see in wise, which effectively like the meta controls. So it's like, how big can this sound ever get in terms of frequency range? How, how small can it be? So we're just kind of bounding it a little bit, just to give it a, a little bit of control. Um, it is, you know, this could be done much, much better. Right? This is a bit of a mess. Uh, we need to evolve that. So let's attempt to get this up and running. Well, I will say that if it crashes, it's not um, Wise's fault, it's not even our DSP, it's because we have to do this flaky Windows things of getting MIDI in to the PC and routing it internally, and all the MIDI is bi-directional, and it's really like Windows really didn't like that. So if you, if, you, if you look at it in the wrong way, it will kind of fall over. Never do live demos. What I can do, though, is uh, it's not as impressive as seeing a control surface. I'll get this working after the session. I'm not going to waste your time, and you can come and see me, and you can have a play, and it's fun. It's like playing an instrument. Um, what I will show you, though, is... So it's, it's less impressive through here because I can't perform it, so you're getting one si static sound. This is it running live. Now, um, obviously, you're, you're performing it as an instrument, what we end up doing is capturing that as MIDI. So we each emote state, and we have about 10 emote states from idling through to little growls, through to dying. Um, each of those is a set of MIDI performances. So I said before, but you know, the problem of how do you perform it? Well, it's performed because I perform it, right? So it's performance capture. Um, but we don't literally use, use the MIDI. So we jitter the MIDI a lot, we shake the values around, we, we do things like change the speed and things like that. So we load a MIDI file into wires on here. Um, so what you're hearing straight from Wise is just, I said, the static preset. When I perform it, when you play it in the game, what you're also bringing in is that performance capture element, which is moving those morph targets and moving kind of the energy in it, and it, and it becomes more, more lifelike, not always quite where I'd like it to be. So anyway, this is my cat, which sounds a bit like a fart. Uh, and I've got this slide on size. So But even just, even just triggering it straight with no performance data in it at all, it, it will always sound a little bit different. I can try and apply the performance data. That's because he's very small. So if I bring him back down a bit. Anyway, so you get your sense. So that's pulling in all that different bits of data. Um, and if you're that way inclined as well, Show you on profiler. I can't see it from there. But it's using uh, less than 2%, it's about 1.5% uh, per, per voice on, on a PC, and it's just as good on PS, PS4. Okay. Okay. So that's uh, the, the structure of how we work. Um, we've got the control surface, 
not working. Uh, but uh, by direction, it communicates to Ys, so that if I uh, uh, change a uh, preset on here, that sends information to Ys, but also change the value in Ys, that goes back. Um, we need it hooked up into some kind of door or sequencer in order to capture the MIDI performance to bring it in. Uh, then on the game side, uh, we've got those MIDI files, and, and optimizing MIDI files for games is actually surprisingly tricky as well, because we can't take in pure MIDI. Uh, going and running into Voc Alien, and then the game is sending all the RTPCs to go, uh, or some of them switches, to go, what creature type am I? So we have about a dozen rough archetypes of creature. Am I a crab-like creature? In which case, can be very different. Am I a rodent-style creature? But the sizes will vary from minuscule through to you know, a dinosaur size. Um, so therefore, we've got the RTPCs there, the controllers, to go, what size am I? And also, what's the ratio between my head and my body? So that changes like how nasally the sound's going to be. So there all the values are coming in. And when we, we were thinking about uh, how do we perform it, uh, so initially we thought about using Perlin noise because the game gives us Perlin noise already, uh, but that's a very kind of regular noise shape and it sounds very artificial. It's interesting, like if you see it, landscape generation, people who know about Perlin noise will pick it up, but otherwise it looks okay. But when you hear it, you can immediately detect that there's regularities and it doesn't work so well. Uh, and also it's hard to kind of create a sense of kind of this little the jitters that you want to hear, that you're expecting. You don't really get that in Perlin. So I've, I've kind of covered this and a little bit time to time, so we'll move on a little bit. But certainly a potential moving forward, and because it's a super trendy subject, and so obviously I have to have a slide on it, uh, would be some kind of machine learning. That would be much more optimal so that we can train it to go, this is what a creature dying sounds like. This is the kind of thing I always do. I always shake it in this way. I always throw these sliders this way. And now derive from that, you can do it through Markov chains, you know, derive from that a typical performance and then let it run. That'd be much more efficient. We'll use uh, less memory and give us kind of more variability. So uh, if I'm uh, to be critical, and I will be critical of what, we, what we've done in the game, um, my performance capture in the game isn't always great. Like, I, I play the game and it makes me cringe sometimes at what the creatures sound like. So hopefully in a future update, I'm going to squash all that and redo all the performances. Because it is like learning an instrument. Right? And when you're finishing off a game, obviously it's chaos. And you need to get everything done and everything in and working. And we didn't spend enough time on, on that performance. And it was also incredibly cumbersome. Now, we've, we've, we've improved all that. So the whole pipeline is uh, much smoother now. And it's not, you know, the synthesis element is not that bad, but as you've seen, like, there's all the surrounding cloud of things that needs to be plugged in. That's not trivial. Right? That takes time to learn, to kind of iterate on. I'm going to skip over this, because I want to talk a little bit about music as well. Okay. So for those of you uh, who've ever come across what I've done before, uh, you'll know I'll often build like, generative music systems uh, for games or be involved in them. Um, essentially, they're glorified random file players with a little bit of logic stuck on top. I, I like doing that stuff. I do a lot of uh, commercial stand installations for things like shopping malls, um, airports. Uh, I'm just a one for a cruise liner. Unfortunately, I don't get to go on a cruise liner. That would be nice. Uh, so we thought, like, this is a perfect opportunity to again build a system for the game. Like, why wouldn't you in a game like this? And we had a band called 65 Days of Static uh, who wrote the music. Um, uh, Sean Murray is a big fan of the band and from the beginning wanted to get them involved and we were kind of really adamant that as a band I did not want to interfere creatively with their process so we always said write an album like just write us an album and we're not going to start telling you how to do that because you know how to do that because you're the band right so we let them go off and, and write a very traditional album but in the knowledge that we were going to come back to it later and just rip it all apart so it wasn't a question of saying, just give us the stems and we'll do it. It was like, no, 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 go right back, uh, do us more performances, uh, take out bits, give us more drum loops, perform new guitar riffs, you know, create new stuff based almost like kind of remixing your original tracks. So that in the game, you don't get the album. Uh, the game soundtrack is bits of what appear on the album. It's lots of, lots of bits that aren't on the album, but it feels, it feels re rel relatively cohesive. That's our album. So again, I've got another little video 
which shows you some of their music so you get a sense of their style. Most of this music is not generative, it's just it's pre-rendered sections that we have in the game. And this is what I was saying about uh, working with a band. Um, you know, just write the album, but keep all the bits. Um, but, so we built the system after they'd written the album, but we just had in mind how we were going to work. So our music system is called Pulse, uh, and I will briefly show you that. Um, and really what it does is it takes individual uh, WAVs, uh, individual elements, and bundles them together into what we'll call an instrument. Um, and we have sets of soundscapes. So we have planet soundscapes, space, uh, wanted, which is combat, and the map, and just some of the special cases we have as well. Uh, uh, currently, there's 16 soundscapes, or 16 sets of soundscapes, so that works out about almost 50 actual soundscapes in the game. Uh, we've got more to come. Um, and all this sits in wise as well. So our tool uh, is ugly, but it's very functional, which is, which is what you need in game design. I'm not going to make a pretty tool, it's a waste of time. And so we have instruments. Uh, we have a little uh, audio editor as well, in case you ever want to use it. So someone could create a stem, literally a stem, and we'll automatically edit it and trim it all up, chop it all up, and stick it in uh, to our system. But really, the key bit is we have this like canvas on which we place these groups of sounds. And the X and Y coordinates are just controllers. Um, the, the controllers are dependent on what's happening in the game. So this is like, it looks complicated, it's not so complicated. This is the map music, uh, which is actually what I did, and it's all directional. So literally it's directional. So in space, depending on which way you're facing, different elements of music will come in and out, different drones will come in and out. Uh, if you're moving or not moving, that also affects the mix. Um, but if you're on a planet, it's different. On a planet, it's how close you are to a building. Or if you've been walking for an amount of time and nothing's happened to you, will start to raise the level of interest just to add something. Uh, to that environment. So that, that's how we compose all the music in the game. Now, I should be able to. So that pulse up there. What I am going to vainly attempt is to run the game. Again, dangerous, especially for so little time. These, uh, this music it plays, um, again, that's randomized. It's, it's rendered, but we've got like 50 different options and it'll just randomly choose. Same when the game starts, it will randomly choose a piece of music. You have to wait through a loading sequence. Blah, 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 blah. And it's, it's, uh, it's doing all this uh, jittering because that's all the um, uh, universe generation process is what it's doing. It's not loading, it's generating all the maths. So I think that's quite, quite clever we're able to render a starscape at the same time. And this is the engine running, this is not artificial, this is the game itself running. Okay. 
So we have, uh, like most games, we've got our own uh, you know, uh, editor tools, and we've got some uh, music systems. Uh, I have to wait for this piece of music to finish before it kicks in the soundscape. Fine. But what you can see is we, I can choose from here what soundscape is set we're going to play, um, where we are, and then I can manipulate where we're sitting within that. So once this finishes, and this will relate to... Don't worry, it's still running. To this. So if I go to variation 6, on planet. So it will start to play this soundscape. Kicking off now. And we have a little bit of debug information what's playing, how many voices are playing. There it goes. Hopefully, if I increase the interest level. I think actually that was the high interest. So we could have one, two abs, we could have 60, 70, 100 variations of each class of sound. And when, when you start the game, we just create a random playlist and it will just randomly shuffle all the different soundscapes. So it's not based on what type of planet it is, just a random playlist. But we'll also look at how long that's playing for. So if you've been on a planet and it's played for more than, I think it's about 15 minutes, then uh, we'll wait for the next sunrise or sunset and then start to kind of change the soundscape based on that. Or if you go into space and come back down, change planet, we'll go, okay, we've played long enough, we'll just change the music. I'll play it wanted maybe. Uh The drums are tricky if you've ever built any systems, like having a loop of different drum loops that actually stay in time uh, when your game engine is maybe dropping frames. So obviously we, ha we have to run on, on our own thread. We have to be really super careful. And actually, it, it does work really well until the game completely explodes. So uh, to conclude, because we're limited on time, um, yeah, No Man's Sky did offer a really uh, interesting opportunity, almost a unique opportunity, to kind of play the idea of randomness uh, in sound. Like an example that I, I could have shown you, it's a limit on time. Um, and I, I, personally, as a sound design and composer, I really enjoy seeding control to the computer and just you know letting it run, giving it rules and letting it run. Um, I think there's a really wonderful potential in procedural audio, but I don't think we're at the point where either the tools are there or that we really realize what that whole process, you know, the whole pipeline is. I think that, that process needs to mature a lot. Uh, it, it, it's easy for me to say because I had the opportunity to do this, but it is wonderful uh, to be able to develop your own audio technology. And I said at the start, that's hard. You know. But if you're able to do that, if you can convince your producer, if you can have a DSP programmer for a few months or, or even longer, I think it's an important part of our jobs, right, as game audio people, to not just accept what's there, but to be able to build new things if we can. And uh, I often get asked if like, any of our tools be commercially available. You wouldn't want them, like, really. We, uh, we wouldn't want to support it. And the fact is, an awful lot of this to, in a nice way, smoke and mirrors. Right? It's not as complicated as it looks. I've shown you what it is. You can do it yourself. You know, there are lots of bits to do, but it's really not that hard. It's just more understanding the process. The actual coding is, I'm not, I'm not saying it's simple, um, but it's not, it's not a massive hurdle. Okay. So I better end there. Uh, in fact, I, I won't take questions because we're all late. Um, sorry, uh, but, but I will hang out outside. I'd be very, very pleased to talk to you. Um, so thank you all for coming. It's lovely to see you. Thank you.